Hi everyone, we're going to begin the talk of Jacob Hallian about uh, testing for beginners. Please uh, shut up uh, or turn off your cell phones uh, and listen. One just one note, uh, for any girls uh, there is the last uh, Google girl, uh, girl bag, so you are free, that's free to take. Enjoy. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to this talk about uh, testing. I'm going to start it with an actual test out of code that uh, we have written in our company. Uh, it tests something very simple. It's a function uh, where we have a fo date format with dashes in and this removes the dashes from the format. And a test has the anatomy that it has some sort of setup, then you do a call into the code, then you do a comparison, and then you have an expected value. And that is the general setup of what a test is. We're going to come back to this, but first I'm going to go into some more theory about testing. When we have a development process, we have a user who has some sort of goals. We need somebody to do an analysis of the goals of the user in order to get some requirements. And then we have a coder who produces a program. This is, of course, a very high-level simplified model of what the development process is. But in this development process, we need to do testing in various different ways. Uh, for the coder, unit tests and integration tests are tools for assuring that the requirements are turned into code that actually fulfill the requirements. Then we have system tests, which actually span the whole area from user goals to the program to ensure that the entire system works together. And then we have acceptance tests and deployment tests. And talking about unit tests, they're also known as component testing, where we verify the functionality of a specific section of code. Normally, it's either a function or a class. And this is actually the definition as taken from Wikipedia. Going up a level, we have integration testing, where we test the interfa interface between components. So we see that they interoperate in a correct way. And there are actually two different schools for how to do this. There is, are those who say that uh, doing it gradually wastes a lot of time, so instead let's do it once to, to test it all at the same time. Though I prefer the incremental model where you add things as you go along. We're not going to go into details about these other tests because as a beginner, the unit tests are the ones you should be focusing on. System testing, as I said, tests a completely integrated system to see that it meets its requirements. And here we're talking about the user's needs rather than just the requirement specification. There are testing frameworks for system testing, but very often you have to do a lot of work on building your own setup for doing the system testing. Acceptance testing is about the user accepting the software as it, as it is. Does it actually solve the user's problem or not? Deployment testing is something where I've actually rolled in a number of different tests that uh, uh, in the literature show up under various different names. But uh, from a developer's point of view, it is sort of a group of tests that you need to uh, 
to do in order to ensure that your code not only works in your development environment, but that it works as intended in its deployed environment. So here you have things like uh, uh, performance testing and tests that you have all the components that are needed in order to run your code, that you have the right version of operating system, etc. But as beginners, what we're focusing on are unit tests, testing the components that you build. And for this, we have various different tools. Included in CPython, in the standard library, is PyUnit, which is a very good tool for doing tests. It's an early tool. It's a copy of the unit test tools for Java. They're simple, they're explicit, and they're there in every version of Python out there. So it's a good thing to use them unless you have more requirements. And usually you have more requirements because you're doing a lot of testing when you've decided that you're going to do testing. And then a framework that's specialized on testing is a very good thing. And we have two of them that uh, are widely uh, used. And it's PyDotTest. It has an advanced algorithm for gathering up tests from your code base and then running them. It has support for a number of different complex setups. It will actually support your integration tests and your system tests as well as supporting uh, unit testing. And it has much better diagnostics than PyUnit. And then there is nose test, which is, has more or less exactly the same functionality as PyDotTest, but it's a dif different implementation, so it works a little differently. And I promised in uh, in the information about this talk that I would give examples of both uh, PyDotTest and PyUnit. And this is the only example I'm giving of PyUnit because uh, PyDotTest is actually, from my perspective, much easier to work with. So it is a little more chatty. This is the same test as I had on my first slide. So instead of saying assert something equals something, we have to say self.assert equal and then something, comma, something. And we also have to inherit uh, unit test or test case for, the, for things to work. While with pi.test, you can just uh, write your tests and then pi.test will take care of things. A very important philosoph philosophical question is, why are we unit testing? How many reasons do we have to actually write tests? And uh, initially you think that, well, it is to say that your code works. But it isn't that simple. There are many reasons for writing tests. The first one is that if we write a test, we can formulate an idea of what our unit should do and what kind of interface it should provide. Now, if we first write the code and then write the test, we're not formulating an idea, are we? We already have the code. So this implies that we should write our tests before we write the code. Because the test makes us think about what kind of interface the code should have. The next thing is that we check that we do what the tests, tests ask while we do the development and 
always in the future. Since we're not doing manual tests, we're doing automated tests. We can reuse these tests over and over and over again. Every time we use the test, we're actually getting a ben benefit of having spent the work of writing the test because it tells us that we haven't made a change that made the code not work in that piece. Next item is that we're writing tests to make the program testable. Now that sounds like a circular uh, reasoning, but it's not. By making the program testable, we're changing our own coding style. So the program becomes different because we are writing tests. And it becomes better because it becomes better structured. We use tests to eliminate bug sources. If we have a program that's in production and somebody finds a bug. I don't know if it happens to you, but it definitely happens to me. When somebody finds a bug, we are in a hurry because the customers are having problems. Having coverage of the code means that you can eliminate an enormous amount of sources for this bug because you've, you have everything tested. So it narrows down where the bug can be. And this saves you an enormous amount of time in critical situations. The next factor is that it helps us understand our code at a later stage. When we've written the code, it's been in production for two years, and we need to make a change. The tests actually tell us things about how the code works. So when we need to do a refactoring, this is really important. Uh, I had a I have a friend who went to a course about uh, mining. And he had an Indian professor who started his lecture by saying, mining is the profitable extraction of minerals from the earth. If it is not profitable, it's not mining. It's merely digging. And about refactoring, I have a similar thing, and that is that if you refactoring is the modification of your code under the constraints of tests. If there are no tests, it's not refactoring. It's merely mucking around in your code. Finally, tests tell us when we're done with a piece of code. Because the tests are the specifications of what the code is supposed to do, as far as we understand our requirements so far. So when your tests pass, you know that you're done. You need not work on this piece of code anymore. And if you're writing your code without tests, you don't really know if you've solved the problem, problem you set out to solve. So when do we run our tests? And essentially, it is always. Uh, we use the tests to check that the code we're working on passes. Sometimes a test suite takes a very long time to run. Then we just run the parts that focus on the bits we're working on. You run your tests before you check in your code into a common repository to ensure that the common repository 
always works. You should have automatic tests being run every time you push your code to a different repository. So something runs automatically and you can go later and check did it pass or didn't it. Because if you made a mistake somewhere, checked in some code that actually didn't run, then this will find it. You want to write, also want to run your code nightly with a full test suite so that you have an audited trail of when your code is working. You've written the tests, you've spent a lot of time on them, so use them as much as you can. Now we come to the core of this talk. What are we testing? How do we write a test? And it turns out that when you analyze what a test actually is, we come up with five different cases. What programs do are that they store information. A unit puts the information somewhere in a data structure. So the test for that is that we store the information in that the data structure, we retrieve it and we check that it is the same information so that where it gets stored is actually the same place as we retrieve it. When we have information in the data structure, we want to retrieve it in order to do something with it. So we store some information and then we check that we can retrieve it. So these two kinds of tests are actually the same except that what is doing the setup and what is doing the checking change places. And then we test calculating things. And that's very simple to test. You make the calculation and then you compare with the expected result. So these kinds of tests are really, really simple to do. So here's an example of testing storing information. It's a very simple example. We have our class X which has a constructor and we test the constructor. We create a value, we create the object with this value and then we look inside the object in order to determine that the value we stored was the one we found in the object. This seems trivial, and it is trivial to do, but the fact that we have this test means that if we change the name of this value, for instance, which we some, sometimes do, the test will fail and we will know to change this name everywhere it fails. Retrieving information. Here we have a getter in the ob object and in order to test it we store some information in the object, we call the getter and we check that we get out the value we expected. Very, very simple. And then we have the example with the date calculation again. That is the calculating bit. So the hard things to test are testing input to the program. And we consider everything that we haven't written ourselves as input. So date, databases, user access, socket connections, third-party libraries. It's all input. And it's harder to test because we have to have some sort of known input on the channel we're testing. 
and then we need to check that it enters the program in the expected form. And for output, it's even harder because then we need to send out the output and then check somewhere outside the system that what we sent out was actually the correct thing. So here's an example of uh, input. We have a database, an SQLite database. So what we do in our PyDot test setup is that we create a fixture where we set up the database and we put some information in it. And then we can do a test that we retrieve the right sort of information from the database. For output, here's an example without code. It's an example of where we're outputting things to a file. So we write the expected result by hand. We make a call to, the generated, to generate the file we want to, to generate. Then we open that file. We open the file with the expected result, compare contents, and if they're equal, the test pass. If not equal, then we should probably show a diff between the files in order to give ourselves uh, or the developer a hint about uh, uh, where the problem actually is. This is not easy. This is hard. Then you get combinations of all these because your code is never divided into the little bits, the five little bits. And this is actually where testing becomes more difficult because you have all these different cases and you may have long series of what you're doing. Especially this one where you retrieve some information from inside the system, you do a calculation and then you do your output. This becomes a very complicated test. Indeed, it becomes so complicated that we want to avoid it. So how do we do that? We refactor our code. Things that can be isolated should be broken out and isolated so that we can test them separately. And this is what I talked about before, that uh, you make your code testable. Always make sure that you split out your outputs and inputs and test them separately. Separate retrieving information from storing information in your, in your own code. And when it comes to the outputs, test the output with simple, unchanging data. Don't put the information you're actually wanting to output on the channel because that's usually hard to test. But if you have very simple data, you can check that your output channel works and then what you put on it is tested as components inside your program. So how do you deal with the things that are really hard to test? You may have components that you need to call that are too complex to do tests against. You cheat. Instead of checking against the comp component that uh, you need to call, you make a mock object which fakes the component. So here I have a mock object of the database that we had before in the input example. Now a database needs to provide a cursor and it needs to provide an execute method. So I'm cheating. I'm saying that every time 
I call the execute method with some sort of SQL command. I'm simply returning this list of, of items. And that may be enough for the testing I need to do. If my testing becomes more complex, then I modify my mock object so it handles exactly those cases that I need to test. The same thing with output. Instead of, of sending things off to a socket, which is really, really hard to test, I can mock my socket. A socket is simply something to which you can connect and then you can write things to. And certainly you can read as well. But if I'm only interested in writing to it, I just implement the right method. So what I do is that I fake my socket and I make a, a string IO buffer. That's a file in memory in Python. And then I, as I write things to this socket, I collect it in this string IO bu buffer. And at the end of my test, I can call the get value on this buffer. And there I have everything I've written to this fake socket. And I can check, did the information I wanted to be there actually end up there? This is so important that there are several frameworks for making mock objects that help you do this. And in Python 3, there is actually one included in the standard library, which is really good. I'm not going into, into details about how to use these. You need to look, look at the tu tutorials for how to do mock objects. Testing does not solve every single problem in the world. It just gives you data points. So your tests need to handle some sort of general case. You should handle all edge cases that you know about. So if you're doing division in the code you're testing, then you should definitely test with something that gives you a division by zero to see what happens. For exceptions, you should certainly test all the ones that you have explicitly set up. So if you have a try something, uh, accept uh, a condition, then you should test for that exception. And in PyTest, the idiom for testing an exception looks like that. And if there are implicit exceptions, ones that may be raised, uh, for instance, when indexing into uh, a dictionary, then you should take care of the important ones there as well. So do I need to test all my code? Well, it depends. All untested code is a technical debt. And technical debt accrues interest. Over time, untested code will generate problems. And the amount of testing you need to do depends on many factors. But the technical debt is all the extra time and cost you have to spend in the future because you didn't write tests when you wrote the code. So this becomes a very, very strong argument for why you should be doing testing. And if you can't do full coverage tests, the most primitive parts of your system are the bits that you should be testing. And the reason for this is that you need a very good foundation for your house. Without a, a good foundation, your house will be rickety no, no matter how well you build it. So always test the most primitive parts first. 
And uh, I will uh, finish this presentation by showing you practically how to develop tests. Uh, it's going to take about five minutes. But before that, uh, I want to tell you that at Open End, we've been working with testing for seven or eight years now. We're available if you need help getting started testing your code. We can be mentors. We can help you with peer programming, code review, set up the tools, set up the infrastructure so that you can test things. So if you're interested, come and talk to me. So I have an assistant here who's going to help me with uh, implementing some code. I have decided that uh, we need an iterator, which generates uh, dates fortnightly, every two weeks. So I've set up this constructor for him to, to work with, which, uh, or this test of a constructor, which uh, creates a fortnightly object and initializes it with a date. And he doesn't have anything except the test. So what he does now is that he runs the test to check that it doesn't pass. And it doesn't pass. It tells him that you don't actually have a mod module called fortnightly. So uh, he creates a file called fortnightly.py. And then he can run, run his test again. And now he gets a different error. Can't import name fortnightly. Well, he didn't put a class called fortnightly in, into his uh, module. So he creates the class. And then he can run his test again. Well, we have a class, but uh, the default constructor for the class doesn't fit the, the model. Uh, sorry, doesn't fit the test. So he will have to create uh, a constructor for the class that fits. And that works. Uh, so now, it complains that uh, we don't have an attribute to uh, current date. So now he has to make uh, his constructor actually do something. And he's done. He's implemented the constructor. Now he's fulfilled the specification. Now he can come to me and say, well, this component that I built, it doesn't actually do something. So I tell him that, well, I have another test here. Uh, it's in uh, the buffer snippet. So we add this test to our little test suite. And then he runs the PyDot test again. And it fails again because he hasn't implemented the bits. So now he has to define the next method. And he runs Python test again. And now it complains that uh, uh, the dates that I'm trying to compare with are not the same because we're actually returning a none instead of the date. So now he needs to make it return a date as well. And we're getting closer. Now we're getting told that uh, we're getting the wrong date because we're just returning the, the same date and not increasing it. 
So now we need to increase the date by 14 days. And we thought we were done, uh, but we aren't, because uh, we're actually just increasing the date by 14 days. And then we go back to the initial uh, information. We're not storing the information that, uh, that needed to be there. So we store the information, we run the test, and it passes. And uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope that this has given you uh, the basis for how to think about testing. The rest is just work. Thank you. Um, you mentioned some frameworks for system testing. Have you got any names that you can recommend to look at? Uh, the one I have to think uh, that I have uh, been using for testing web frameworks is Selenium. And indeed, there have been a number of uh, talks about testing uh, here at EuroPython, and I rec recommend Harry Percival's talk about uh, testing with Django, where he goes through how to use Selenium to test your Django framework. Uh, how do you organize tests? Uh, you're putting um, file, library, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not uh -huh. that... Uh, that's, that's a very good question, and I should actually have put that in, into your talk, in, into the talk. Uh, what I normally do, and what uh, PyDotTest supports, is that beneath every directory where you put your code, you put a directory called test, and in that test you put files called test underscore and the name of the module you're testing. And then you put all the tests for that module in there. And then you can make su subdirectories if you need to store information uh, data that are used in those tests beneath, beneath the test library. Can I add something to that, Jacob? Certainly. Um, that's, that's easier, yes. Um, and then basically what, what what we generally do is, in the test file, we mimic the structure of the module that, the, the module that is testing. So, for each class in the module, there will be a te com corresponding test class in the in the test file, so that they sort of mirror each other. Uh, which is the Python 3 uh, instruction you uh, mentioned before? You said that uh, for unit testing, uh, it has been uh, introduced a great feature in uh, Python 3. Uh, the mock-up object. Mock object, yes. Okay, it's included in the library. But mock object is, uh, for Python 2, available as a separate package. It's just not included in the standard library. So it doesn't come with a distribution. Thanks. I'm sorry, but the time is over. Uh, the next talk will be about uh, pyramids from Dumas in about uh, Dumas in about uh, five minutes. And well, see you. Yeah.